has already mentioned, uh, my ministry has been in uh, Diocese of Chelmsford for the last uh, 34, 35 years. Um, but actually, I grew up in Chelmsford as well. My father was a vicar and prison chaplain in Chelmsford, so kind of this, uh, this is my, uh, my home, this county. Um, however, I never actually ministered in the, uh, in the Colchester Episcopal part of the diocese uh, until I took on this post. So I'm very grateful to Bishop Roger for allowing me to complete my uh, grand tour of the, uh, of the diocese. But it's been lovely to, to get to know um, the, the different communities, parishes, churches, and uh, congregations in the area, although obviously over the last 18 months it's not been as, uh, as easy to do that as I would have liked. But it's lovely to be here in person rather than looking at everyone down a, uh, a computer screen, which uh, many of us have been doing for uh, quite a few months. Let's uh, be still for a moment as we come to worship this morning. And uh, we're thinking about the question that Jesus asked of his disciples. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And in our worship this morning, we're going to answer that question in our singing, in our praying, in our reading of God's word, and in our celebrating of communion together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Okay. And also with you. As we ask God to prepare our hearts for worship as we pray to Him. Almighty God, to, to whom all hearts, hearts are open, open all the desires known, known, and, and from, from whom those secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. So we come before God in a time of confession, remembering those words from the scriptures. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we pray to him. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved our neighbours, we have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. So may the God of love and power forgive you and free you from all your sins, heal and strengthen you by his Spirit, and bring you to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So, with that promise of God's forgiveness, we stand to praise him as we join together in the words of the Lord. Glory to God in the highest. And peace to his people on earth. Lord God, God Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have a mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. You alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the glory of God the Father. Amen. Colleague, for this 15th Sunday after Trinity, God, in generous mercy, sent the Holy Spirit upon your church in the burning fire. 
power of your life. Grant that your people may be fervent in the fellowship of the gospel, and always abiding in you, they may be found steadfast in faith and active in service. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 And we sit for the first bow. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The servant of the Lord said, The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning, he wakens my ear to listen to those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face where I flint, and I know I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me. Who will declare me guilty? This is the word of the Lord. Hear the Gospel of our Lord according to Mark. Mark chapter 8, beginning at verse 27. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, Who do you say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your minds not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any of you want to come after me and be my followers, then let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life. Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in glory, the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise Thank to you, you, O Christ. Speak in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I guess uh, all of us at uh, some point in our lives have to ask or answer a crucial question. We get asked lots of questions, don't we, in our lives, but every now and again we're asked a question which is a real um, crucial question, something that might uh, change our lives or the direction of our lives. Perhaps it's a question that we're asked in uh, an interview for a job and depending how we answer is going to determine whether we get that job or not. Or maybe it's uh, a question that some of us have asked, asked and answered here. Will you marry me? And again, depending on the answer, depends the whole direction of our future lives. In our Gospel reading this morning, we reach a pivotal point in the Gospel. In fact, it's a, an incident in Mark chapter 8 that comes exactly halfway through the Gospel of Mark. It's the turning point. It's a critical moment in the Gospels. Jesus has travelled with the disciples to the most northern part of Israel, a place called Caesarea Philippi, and there he asks a question. Well, actually, he asks two questions. First of all, he says to the disciples, 
who do other people say that I am? And they respond, respond with various uh, answers. Some people say you're John the Baptist. Other people say that you're Elijah or one of the other prophets. A great person who God has raised up to do his work. And then Jesus says to the disciples, okay, that's who people say that I am. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter, in a moment of inspiration and insight, says, you are the Messiah. You are the Messiah. And Jesus welcomes his answer, although at that point he tells the disciples not to say anything to anyone else. What does it mean to say, in answer to that question, who do you say that I am? You are the Messiah. Well, the word Messiah, which uh, we also know as the word Christ, uh, means anointed one. An anointed one, the anointed one of God. It's a, uh, a title that was used of various people in the Old Testament. Kings were anointed in order to lead the people of Israel. So in that sense, they were, were like messiahs. They were anointed ones of God. You didn't even have to be a king of Israel. Um, for example, the, uh, the king Cyrus, a foreign king, was described in those terms because he was responsible for enabling the people of Israel to return from exile. But by the time of Jesus, this term, messiah, had become much more focused. Focused on one person who God was going to send, raise up, in order to release the people of Israel from oppression and captivity and establish the kingdom of God. And so the people of Israel were looking for a Messiah, the anointed one of God who has come to liberate and to save them. And at this moment, at this critical moment, Peter says, you are the Messiah. It takes place in a very interesting place, Caesarea Philippi. Um, it's called Caesarea Philippi because one of Herod's sons uh, built a temple there, in that place, in honour of Caesar, who was worshipped as being divine. Caesar was regarded as being a divine son of the gods, the son of God. Uh, Caesarea Philippi is an interesting place because not only is there a temple, was there a temple to Caesar there, um, there are also shrines to various other gods as well. For example, there was a cave there, you can go and see it today. Um, a cave that was be believed to be the place where, where the god Pan resided. And various other shrines were there as well. And so in this place where various people are honoured and worshipped, Peter at this moment says, you are the Messiah, God's anointed one. More important than any of these other figures, you are the one who God has chosen, anointed, to liberate his people and establish the kingdom of God. And this morning, as we come to worship, we come to acknowledge that Jesus is our Messiah, the anointed one for us, the Lord for us, the one whom we commit ourselves to following. We are answering that question, who do you say that I am, by saying we believe that you are the Son of God, the one whom God the Father has sent to bring liberation, freedom, forgiveness, not just to the people of Israel, but for all people, for all time. And so we gather to worship this morning. But then something happens which is completely unexpected because the people thought of the Messiah in terms of uh, a, a conquering liberator, a military figure, someone who's going to lead Israel and drive out Israel's enemies. But instead, Jesus says, let me tell you about my Messiahship. And so he explains that he's going to journey towards Jerusalem and it's going to be the place not of a great coronation 
not of the driving out of the Romans, Pilate as Caesar's representative, but it's going to be a place where he is taken, arrested, rejected, punished, and crucified, put to death. This is completely against the expectation of people for the Messiah. It doesn't make sense. And even Peter can't handle it. Having said, you are the Messiah, he now can't handle what Jesus says the Messiah is all about and what he is going to do as Messiah. And so he says, no, no, Lord, this can't be right. And at that moment, Jesus rebukes him and says to him, get behind me, Satan. Why? Well, Satan, figure representing all that stands in opposition to the will and purpose of God. And at that moment, Peter is aligned with that rather than with God's purposes. And so Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. You've got it completely wrong, Peter. And so we see in what comes after Peter's great declaration, the nature of Jesus' messiahship and the nature of the discipleship of those who will follow him. And it will be a path that is marked by suffering and shame. And so Jesus says, not only will I go to Jerusalem and there face suffering and death and then be raised by my Father, but those who would follow me will also experience that same suffering. And he uses a phrase which I think has lost its meaning for us today. He says this, he says, if anyone wants to be my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now, when we talk about carrying a cross today, we, we, we think in terms of referring to a, a burden. It might be a physical burden we have or a, an emotional burden or, or something that's happened to us. And we say, oh, that's the cross I have to bear. It's a phrase that people use, don't they? Well, I'm afraid that waters down what Jesus was talking about. He wasn't talking about just a hardship or a difficulty in life. You see, in Jesus' day, if you saw someone carrying a cross, they were on a short one-way journey and they weren't coming back from it. If you were carrying a cross, you were marked for death. Anyone who saw someone carrying a cross knew that they were going to die. And so Jesus says, what will happen to me may well happen to you if you follow me. It may even be the path of death. Are you prepared for that if you declare me as the Messiah, as God's appointed one, as the Lord? And we know that that was the fate of several of Jesus' followers, that they were put to death because they dared to proclaim Jesus as Lord. Now today, of course, we don't face uh, that uh, fate in our own country. If we were to go out from here and say, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is the Messiah, we're not about to be um, arrested and beaten up and, and put to death. But our brothers and sisters in different parts of our world face that fate for daring to name Jesus as the Messiah today. Our new Bishop of Chelmsford, Bishop Gully. I uh, met her father uh, many years ago, back in uh, the mid-1980s. He came and spoke at uh, the Theological Church College where I was trained he could be ordained. Uh, bishop Gully's father was the Bishop of Iran for 30 years, from 1960 to 1990. But for the last 10 years of his time as bishop, he was in exile with his family because the Ayatollah had taken over in that country and therefore uh, Christians were being persecuted and he and his family had to flee. And I remember him sharing how his son had been put to death by the Iranians. It literally cost him his life to be a follower of Christ. And uh, the last 10 years of the bishops uh, time as Bishop of Iran were in exile in this country uh, where he and his family uh, were welcomed and lived and 
uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful that his daughter has now been uh, uh, enthroned, she was last uh, week, as uh, the Bishop of Chelmsford. But she knows that these words of Jesus are not mere glib phrases. To take up your cross, to follow him, can be a matter of life and death. And we think of our brothers and sisters in other parts of our world today, in Afghanistan at the moment, where Christians are now living in fear because they don't know what is going to happen, how the Taliban are going to react to their presence. Christians living in northern Pakistan who are on death row because they've been charged with blasphemy to, for daring to proclaim that Jesus is Lord. So we pray for our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world for whom taking up the cross and following Jesus really is a matter of life and death. And we give thanks that we are free to worship Jesus as Lord in our own country today. But there's something else that Jesus says. He says it's not just a path of suffering but a path of shame as well. You see, to die the death that Jesus died was the most shameful sort of death. And therefore it was impossible for people to imagine that the person put to death on the cross could be God's anointed one, the one whom God has chosen as Messiah. St Paul recognised this. He said, we preach Christ crucified. It is foolishness to the Greeks. Greeks. The Greek philosophers would laugh at us for saying that, that God is somehow in this figure being put to death on a cross. It's laughable to imagine that that's how God would act. And the Jews believed that it was a mark of shame to die such a death. Cursed is the one who is put to death on a tree. And so Paul says it's a stumbling block to the Jews to say that the Messiah is the one who was crucified. And so Jesus says that to believe in me and my sort of messiahship may indeed be something that is seen as a mark of shame. And we know that for Peter, don't we? Remember those last hours of Jesus' life when he's on trial. Peter is out, outside in the courtyard and someone sees him, a young serving girl, and she says, aren't you with Jesus? Aren't you one of his followers? Aren't you a Galilean who's come from the north with him? And Peter is ashamed to be identified with him at that moment. I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. Leave me alone. He's nothing to do with me. Jesus said, those who are ashamed of me, the Son of Man will be ashamed of when he returns. We know that in Peter's case, he met the risen Lord and was forgiven for that mark of shame that he carried from that time. And what about us when it comes to proclaiming Jesus as Lord, as Messiah? No, we don't face the ultimate penalty for being a follower of Jesus. But I think in our society to do today, we do face more and more ridicule and shame for being known as Christians. It's easy to say that Jesus is Lord as we meet together to worship this morning. Not so easy at school, in the place of work or in the community, where society and culture is moving further and further away from the Christian faith, where uh, many prominent figures in our culture, people like Richard Dawkins and others, now laugh at Christians, say it's ridiculous to believe in God, to believe that Jesus was his son. Are we prepared to stand up and continue to say that Jesus is Lord, that he is the one that we have committed ourselves to following, that we are not ashamed of the gospel that we proclaim, that through this person, the Messiah, God has accomplished all that was necessary 
that we might know his love and his forgiveness and the new life that he has to offer. In our worship this morning, let us proclaim that Jesus is Lord. Let us answer that question, who do you say that I am? Like Peter and say, you are the Messiah. But let's not just do it in our worship this morning. Let's do it in our lives as we go from this place today, whatever lies ahead of us in the weeks and months to come. Amen. So we're going to proclaim our faith. We're going to answer that question, who do you say that I am, as we say together the words of the Nicene Creed. So let us stand to proclaim our faith. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally and God of the Father, God from God, life from life, true God from true God, the God of the not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified and was crucified, he suffered and death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one Holy Catholic and the Holy Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us sit on the altar to pray. Let us praise God for his mercy and pour out to him our worries and anxieties knowing he will hear us. We pray, Lord, for our church, undergoing great challenges following the pandemic, when people found new ways to praise you and to worship virtually rather than in person. We pray for our new Bishop of Chelmsford, Dr. Gooley, as she takes up her call to travel well together at this difficult time. We pray for those in our church family who feel unable to join us. Let us keep them in our hearts. Merciful Father, accept hear our prayer. We are sorry that we have damaged your creation and Mother Earth is suffering from climate change through our greed and thoughtlessness. <coughs> During the pandemic, we had an awareness of nature. We listened to the birds sing we had time to watch plants grow and flowers blossom. Make us aware that we can make changes to limit the damage to the environment and protect God's handiwork for future generations. Merciful Father, hear our prayer. At this time, 20 years ago, we were reeling after the traumatic events of 9-11 in America. We struggled to comprehend man's hatred for his fellow man, that he could cause such destruction and loss of life. The resulting action led to many years of fighting, injury and death, which feels pointless now, as lives for so many have once again been changed beyond all measure. We pray for the people of Afghanistan, who will live under increasingly strict rule, where women will not be hurt, will not be educated or treated as equals. We pray for peace, understanding and tolerance. We pray for all those seeking to leave their countries through warfare, oppression and poverty. Help us to open our hearts 
to all those in need of a safe haven. Merciful Father, hear yeah. yeah, our prayer. We pray for those in need of healing, comfort and solace. The pandemic has left a legacy of overwhelming loneliness, heartbreak, pain and tiredness. We pray for supper and light in our darkness that your healing love will bring. We pray particularly today for Jean Ayres, who has had a stroke, and Michael Hassan, who is now bedbound. We continue our prayers for Ron Atwood, Ernest Campbell, David Clapson, Yvonne Driffield, Bryn Gaydon, Roger Green, India Tuck, and Trisha Wenborn. Let us also bring before God those who we know who are ill at this time. May God's healing love surround and comfort all those who suffer. Merciful Father, yeah. we pray for those nearing the end of their earthly lives and those who have died recently, particularly Brenda Atwood and Doreen Davies, confident that they are now in your loving care. We remember their families and friends who mourn their passing. We pray too for Arthur Hunwick and Gordon Nielsen, servants of Christ who died at this time in recent years. And we also remember the victims of 9-11. Merciful Father, hear our prayer. Loving Lord, we pray for ourselves, knowing that you will provide for us as we take up the cross. Light our paths and life's journey and keep us safe today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you please stand? The risen Lord came and stood amongst his disciples and said, Peace be with you. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And all the same with you. Let's offer one another a sign of peace. Peace with you. Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendour, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All, all things, things come, come from you, from you and of your own to give you. The Lord is here. The Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Father, we give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living Word, through whom you have created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Saviour. By the power of the Holy Spirit, who took flesh, as your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin, he lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Holy Lord, Lord, Lord God, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Granted by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your Holy Word, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. With the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Same way after. 
after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. And he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for men, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. So, Father, all into mind is death on the cross. His perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people, and gather into one in your kingdom, all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we in the company of the Blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints may praise and glorify you forever, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom, thy kingdom come, thy will, will be done, on earth as it is, is in heaven. Give us Pass this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though, Though we are many, we are, we are one body, because, because we all share in one bread. Thou of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have, Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take, take away the sin of the world. world. Have, have mercy, mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Let us pray. Keep, O Lord, your church with your perpetual memory, because without you our human frailty cannot but fall. Keep us ever by your health from all things hurtful, and lead us to all things profitable to our salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So we pray together. Almighty God, we thank, thank you for feeding us, us with the body the and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. So we sing the second of our hymns, hymn number uh, 14. And uh, we had a bit of a, a discussion about whether we would leave any of the verses out here, but looking at the hymn, we've actually got to sing all the verses because they all flow from one to another. And it's a great hymn anyway. So let's stand to sing Christ Triumphant. Everywhere.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.